This is going to be uh, the start of notes for today, for October 7th, uh, for Unit 4. We left off with the communal experiments last Thursday. Um, so now we're going to be looking at, uh, picking up from there, we, we mentioned that there's, there's a variety of these. The, the most common denominator that they all are developing and reaction to what? Materialism. Materialism as well as like the, you know, all industrialization, the class changes, class shifts, all that's taking place. We mentioned Brook Farm, which was more secular or religious? Secular, secular right? So it's more secular and it's based on transcendentalist ideas. Uh, they live pretty much in common. They work together, live together, but it didn't really work out in the end because of the fire and death they racked up. Shakers we talked about. Shakers were more religious based. There were various communities of these, like there's multiple Shaker communities, but they were also a bunch of weirdos because um, they also held property and work in common, but they also kept men and women separated and didn't encourage or didn't allow for marriage or sexual relations. So they just basically faded out over time because um, no one wanted to join them. So, But all that we talked about Thursday. Is everybody's good? Yes? Okay, moving on to New Harmony. So New Harmony was a secular experiment in, experiment in Indiana. New Harmony was a secular experiment in Indiana. Developed by a British industrialist named Robert Owen. So Robert Owen, spelled just like it sounds, Robert Owen, was a British industrialist who came over here to try to like, develop this uh, model society away from all the materialism and so forth. He hoped the community would provide an answer to the problems of inequality and alienation. So he hoped that the community would provide an answer to the problems of inequality and alienation. So he hoped that the community would provide an answer to the problems of inequality and alienation because of industrialization. Uh, it, it failed like many others because of financial problems. They couldn't figure, you know, make enough money to pay off debts or pay their fees. Uh, there's also a lot of disagreements among their members about how they should operate. So Robert Owen's experiment fails after so many years. He ends up going back to Great Britain after his attempt. Um, but it was, another, it was another way to try to address this, these problems created, these inequalities created by uh, industrialization. Next is the uh, Oneida community in New York. The next one is the Oneida community, which was another religious-based one. So the Oneida community in New York made by a guy named John Neuer. You don't know that name, but John Neuer developed this one in 1848. So Oneida community in New York, which I think it's marked on this map. No, no, it's not. Oh, no, it's, it's written up here. Okay, so it is not in the key. Sorry. It's up there. On the, it's up there like middle of New York. Um, so he, just, he dedicated to the idea of a perfect society, a, a perfect society and economic equality. So he was dedicated to this idea of a perfect society and economic equality. You see a lot of common thing, themes here. There are also a lot of them are trying to do like uh, communal living in the sense of like sharing property, sharing pools, sharing responsibilities, all in commune. Communism. Communism, right? And every single one what? Fail. Fail, right? <laughs> Hell yeah, right? <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Industrialization, capitalism. Anyway, um, so, however, they, not only did they, were they dedicated to the idea of a perfect society and economic equality, they also I dedicated to the idea of shared property and later shared marriage partners. Um, so over time, they also were open to the idea of a lot of things, like shared yeah. married partners. <laughs> 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 But the, re but the reason being, the reason being is because it was kind of like planned parenting in terms of like, we want to make, produce the best children as possible. Uh, so they not only had shared partners, but they also had like shared parenting and uh, shared child rearing as well. So it was like planned reproduction and communal rearing of your children. <laughs> but this one actually survives for quite a long time because they sell a bunch of silverware. So like they make money selling silverware, uh, and that becomes like their main in way of income. So there you go. So they actually last. Yeah, they last a few decades. Yes. Wasn't 
Uh, it, uh, he didn't get, get killed here, so if he had another attempt on his life, he might have been there. I don't know. There's only one guy that shot Garfield. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Show it to the link, send the link or something. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. All right. The last one is the four year phalanxes. The last one is the four year phalanxes. Is there ever a guy named Charles Fourier who was French? Can't tell. So Charles or Fourier. Charles Fourier or Fourier, Fourier probably. Um, developed uh, this idea of another utopian society. He was a French socialist. So he's a French socialist. He advocated sharing work. There it is again. He advocated sharing work and living spaces. He advocated sharing work and living spaces. But his, like many of these other ones, died out pretty quickly by the 1840s. And that is, uh, that's it for the communal experiment. Now on a test, would you have to really know each individual reason and what they did? Not really. The only one that tend to, tend to show up is Brook Farm separately. So Brook Farm, you need to be associated with transcendentalists. But as far as the other ones go, uh, just know they form for secular and religious reasons. It'd probably be the most helpful to know which one was secular, which one's religious. But other than that, that's pretty much as deep as you got to go. As far as just know why did they form and why did they form? Counteract materialism. Counteract materialism, reject society as it was developing into, try to go off and make something better. And all of them didn't work out, but they tried, right? All right. Uh, next, we're going to look at very briefly art, architecture, and literature. We're going to very briefly look at art, architecture, and literature. Um, so, again, we're looking at art, architecture, and literature in the first half of the century, not just necessarily the 20s. Um, basically, everything 1800 to about 1850. You have a new national culture emerging, thus, you have new art, architecture, and literature. Uh, where you're combining European themes as, as well with a lot of local and regional sensibility. So, you know, romanticism or the romantic period is very big in this era, which is big in Europe at the same time. But the South might have a unique version of this versus the North here in America based on their regional identities. But we're very much, we in Europe still very much have a lot of similarities in terms of our art and literature right now. Uh, one of the most famous early artists is John James Audubon. John James Audubon uh, painted just down the road at Oakley Plantation. His very famous birds, very you know realistic birds. He uh, categorized and depicted a lot of birds in in America. Some of those paintings are still here in Louisiana. Uh, so art by the 1830s was painting everyday life. That was very common for art. By the 1830s was painting everyday life. Um, things like riding riverboats or doing domestic chores or boating. That's what you would paint. Side stuff. So people were very much into painting everyday life. Common man, right? So the common man, you want to demonstrate common things, right? So you show people doing very common uh daily to uh, chores. The Hudson River School was an art movement within Romanticism. So all this was part of the Romantic period, but the Hudson River School itself, art movement, was a movement within the Romantic uh, period. It expressed Romanticism, but also the fascination with the natural world. So the Hudson River School art movement expressed Romanticism, but also the formation of, the, I'm sorry, fascination with the natural world. Meaning like they did a lot of landscapes, a lot of like natural beauty. These are two paintings right here of landscapes in the Hudson uh, River School. Two biggest names associated with this are Thomas Cole and Frederick Church. Thomas Cole and Frederick Church are the two biggest names for this. Frederick Church. And they emphasize a lot of the heroic beauty of U.S. landscapes. In architecture, uh, the U.S. adopted a lot of Greek styles, Greco-Roman uh, themes after the Revolution. Uh, obviously, we're big into democracy here. Um, we like to celebrate that by making a lot of our buildings look very Greco-Roman because we're big into re Republican government and democracy. So not just Washington, D.C. If you look at like every capital's government and all these governmental buildings, a lot of columns, a lot of archways, right? some domes like, the, like in Congress. 
Um, every single capital in the country looks the same except for which one? They pretty much all have the same structure except for whose? Ours. We have what? <laughs> Giant tower, right? So we have... So we don't, every other, if you look at every other uh, state capital, they look like a miniature Congress, essentially. Like with a dome in the middle and like two houses on each side. But ours is the uh, largest state capital in the, in the land. Mm -hmm. You're saying that, I didn't say that. She said that. I'm going to go to Vermont one day. Listen, this is about U.S. history, not mythical lands like Narnia or Vermont. <laughs> All right, anyway. Uh, uh, so composites are very big, a lot of public entryways and public buildings. Then we need the literature. So let's talk about Romanticism in general. Romanticism in general, as, have you, you haven't gotten that yet in English yet, correct? Okay, Romanticism in general is, you don't have to necessarily portray things in a very realistic manner. A lot of times you fo focus on heroic deeds or people who might do things extraordinary. You romanticize what people are doing, right? You're, you're kind of embellishing a little bit here. So there's a series of writers who begin to do this. Uh, one of your first early American fictional writers is Washington Irving. So Washington Irving is one of your earliest American writers who writes fiction around the teens and 20s. Uh, famously, he writes Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. So Sleepy Hollow, Ichabod Crane comes to town, Hellas Horseman, all that. But if you actually read the story, it's implied that the Hellas Horseman might have been one of the other characters in town, tricking Ichabod Crane. Uh, then Rip Van Winkle is a story about this man who, kind of lazy, doesn't like his wife too much, goes off and plays uh, games with his buddies and drinks all day, goes to the mountains in New York one day, and sees these, like, not mystical, but maybe mythical people in the mountains. He ends up playing lawn bowling and falls asleep, wakes up 20 years later, and it's like before and after the revolution. And it's kind of commentary, like, about America before and after the revolution, how it, nothing, not much has really changed. Um, but the common theme between both Sleepy Hollow and that book is kind of like the established people in an area versus the new incomers, like, you know, Ichabod Crane coming to Sleepy Hollow, so on. So that's kind of a common theme there. Is these. So, but you can, have, you can have, like, mystical or mythical type things happen. Nathaniel Hawthorne is also like that. You kind of get a little, hey, I got the part where the guy rips his shirt open and all that? Yes. Y'all are done? Okay, okay. But there's a lot of that, but even though it's very much based in reality, there's a lot of, like, kind of fantastic elements a little bit in there in Nathaniel Hawthorne's book, but he's a romantic writer too, right? So that's another example. Uh, but like later when you get to Huckleberry Finn or like Mark Twain, it's realistic, right? So everything that happens is like straight on, right? It's no, there's no real like interpretation, I guess, going on there. You know? um, anyway, so uh, that's one author. James Fenimore Cooper is another. James Fenimore Cooper is another author. He writes a series of books called The Leather Stocking Tales. These books include like Last of the Mohicans, The Pathfinder, and The Deerslayer. So these books include Last of the Mohicans, The Pathfinder, and Deerslayer. He glorified a lot of the frontiersmen and nature's noblemen. So he glorified a lot of the frontier as nature's noblemen. Then you have Hawthorne, Scarlet Letter. I'm not a big fan of Scarlet Letter. I think I said this in class too. Um, I don't. I think it was kind of boring. Um, but I like a lot of his short answers. I mean, short answers, short stories. A lot of his short stories are very good. Uh, if you ever get to go read those, I don't know if you read them in class or not. But I enjoy those a lot more than I enjoyed his um, the novel. He also lived at Brick Farm. I hope you read that too. So. And the last guy is Herman Melville. Herman Melville writes in the 1850s. Moby Dick. About this white whale that these guys are searching for as a revenge for what for taking the captain's leg. But uh, Moby Dick reflected theological and cultural conflicts of the era. Herman, Herman Melville and Moby Dick is the book. This is a picture of the books you see here. Watch uh, Sleepy Hollow, Scarlet Letter, Leather Talking Tales, Moby Dick. There's the four authors there. 
your early romantic writers. You had, you, like, you had, like, Edgar Allan Poe in this time period, too, but he's considered gothic, which is, like, a subgenre of romanticism. So, anyway. All right, we're going to stop the first video there.